want to add that, uh, but, pero lo diré en español, huh? si queréis hacer la pregunta en castellano, no hay ningún problema, huh? porque lo que queremos hoy es realmente que, que se crea debate, que se hagan las preguntas, entonces no se siente uh, inhibido por el tema de, del idioma. Huh? Si, si se hacen las preguntas en castellano, nosotros la, la traduciremos Uh, para, para los oradores. Entonces, por favor, uh, que este no sea un, uh, un freno para, para nadie. Continuamos. It is my pleasure to be here in Barcelona and would like to welcome you to our second session. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to chair this session with my colleague, Dr. Dominic. This topic really is very important now. And I would like to congratulate the organizer for such huge events. We didn't expect such uh, participants, such audience, and uh, I would like to uh, express my congratulation. We published last year um, opinion at the same topic in the Middle East Society Journal. So I was surprised that this event become true. It is now a time to consider this topic because it is worldwide unacceptable event and this became possible after the era of vitrification. I would like to call Dr. Laura to give us her opinion and to show us her experience with the vitrification of human oocytes. Dr. Laura is co-founder co of Genera Centers for Reproductive Medicine in Italy and laboratory director of the centers in Rome. Previously, she was laboratory director at the Center for Reproductive Medicine of European Hospital in Rome for 11 years. Her topic today is oocytic cryopreservation. What are the evidence? Dr. Laura, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, the audience. It's really a great pleasure to be part of this fantastic meeting. I really would like to, to thank the organizer for this opportunity. And this is my favorite topic, most of all. So oocyte cryopreservation, what are the evidence? Do we have acceptable chance of pregnancy to offer this technology to our patient for any kind of reason, which can be age-related reason, but also medical reason and uh, other reasons? So first of all, as an embryologist, I would like to underline that cryopreservation is really an essential part of assisted reproductive technology. And it offers a lot of opportunity. So I think that each laboratory has to have a very good cryopreservation program for any stage of development. Because it is the only way to lower the number of embryos to be transferred while maintaining the same cumulative pregnancy rate. And of course, multiple pregnancy is something that we have to avoid in our treatment. But also we can delay the transfer of our embryos and allow fertility preservation. So cryopreservation is essential. It is estimated that uh, it, con it contributes to our take-home baby rate of about 30%, but with a systematic use of cryopreservation, I'm sure that this percentage can be much higher. And what about all side cryopreservation? It is a relatively new technology. It has been introduced only a few years ago in the routine, but it has already a key place, and we are here today to hear about this. It allows to preserve a female fertility, and it is very important when we think about medical reasons, but also social reason, also for egg donation program, to avoid the production of supernumerary embryo where it is not allowed, or where the patient has uh, some ethical or moral or religious issue about embryo cryopreservation, you know that we had this problem in Italy for legal reasons, and also for the accumulation of excess oocytes in our eye cycle. So a very new technique with already so many applications. Every embryologist has to face this 
we have to implement our lab with all site cryo preservation because we may face one of these or all these applications. So it is our responsibility. Why it has been so difficult to introduce all site cryo preservation? First of all, because it's difficult to obtain results, and we will go through this later on in the presentation, but also because for many years, and this is 2006 and 2008, there was a prejudice related to all site cryo preservation. It was considered as an experimental technology. And this is ISRM uh, statement in 2006 and 2008. But today, things have changed. In 2012, I think this is a couple of months ago, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine has changed this label and all site cryopreservation is not anymore an experimental technology. And why this happened? This is really important. Also to say to our patient, it is a, a very important statement coming from one of the biggest society in reproductive medicine. Coming from America, but in this case, we can trust Americans, I think. And this is based on evidence, on the literature. And I am so proud to be Italian, and you should be proud to be Spanish, because this evidence came from our country. For different reasons. In Spain, because of the egg donation program, and in Italy, because of very severe legal restriction. But this gave us the opportunity to set up a good all-site cryopreservation program. So let's make one step back. Why it has been so difficult to introduce all side cryopreservation and so easy to introduce embryo. If you think that the first embryo was uh, cryopreserved was successfully done, I don't know, 40 years ago. And only now we are talking about all side. Just because the all side is a very sensitive and special cell, but has to do a lot of things. And at metaphase two stage, it's very sensitive to any additional treatment that we do in the lab. So it's really for the biological specificity of this cell that it has been so difficult to introduce cryopreservation and also the dimension and the function of this cell, which is also very sensitive to aging and in vitro culture. So there was a reason why it has been so difficult. But now we have enough evidence to change our mind and I would like you to change our mind. So this is some of the publication. There is a big bias here, because I have chosen all the publication coming from my center, but just because I know them better, and I can explain better what has been done from 2008 and 2012 to make the American society change its mind about all site cryopreservation. And as you can see, we have randomized controlled trial, and this is very rare in reproductive medicine. Very rare to have randomized controlled trials, which has, the, of course, the higher level of evidence-based medicine comparing a new technology. ICSI was introduced without randomized controlled trial. Ambio cryopreservation was introduced without randomized controlled trial. But for all sides, it has been done. And we should really look to these results. So, of course, the first evidence came from the lab. And this is Anna Kobo results, the first one that really introduced this Japanese technology inside her laboratory for egg donation program. And it came also from our center. We wanted to demonstrate how was the in vitro performance of all sites after cryopreservation, in particular after vitrification. And this paper, which was published in 2011, was the most downloaded paper on human reproduction. And it was only dealing about laboratory evidence. So imagine how many people were interested all around the world about all size prior preservation. So there's a great interest for many, many reasons. And what were our results? It was, I was really surprised and I was really happy that the in vitro performance of cryopreserved oocyte by vitrification was really similar to what we normally obtain with fresh oocytes. They behave in the same way. And this is sibling oocyte, oocyte coming from the same court. We could do it because of our law that restricted the number of oocytes that we could inseminate at that time. Luckily, it changed. 
So you see no statistical difference for any of the parameters. And of course, a paper which is based on sim-legal site, it's a very trustable results, although the number are not so high. But this is only laboratory results. As I said, randomized controlled trials means high level of evidence-based medicine. And if you think about meta-analysis of randomized controlled trial, then you, have the, you are on the top of the pyramid, higher level of evidence-based medicine. So we can state today that all site vitrification works better than slow freezing when you think about survival. It's a statement. And that all site vitrify perform as well as fresh all site when you think about, sorry, about um, fertilization. Here the outcome was fertilization rate. But in vitro performance is not enough. What we want is baby, healthy baby. So to know that the old side behave very well in the lab is only a very small part of the story. But it is much more difficult to demonstrate the efficiency from a clinical point of view because of course then you have a lot of confounding factors related to the patient. Much more difficult. So let's see what we have. But there I cannot make any statement as I did for, for the laboratory outcomes. So this is our paper. At that time, we were obliged to inseminate only three fresh oil sites, and all the, the rest of the oil site by law were cryopreserved. And here you have the results on the top line of a fresh oil site, and here the results obtained in the same patient, the patient that failed the fresh attempt, they come back to make a second attempt with vitrified oil sites. And what we notice is that the results are generally lower when you use vitrified all side, but it's not comparable. The best patient have been lost in the fresh attempt because they got pregnant with a fresh all side. So we cannot really compare the two. And here the transfer was done on a spontaneous cycle. Here it was a stimulated cycle, so the endometrium can be different in favor of vitrified all side in this case. So it's really confusing. So I don't want to, to compare the two groups. What I want to show you with these slides it's that in young patient population, where we know that the old sites are of very good quality, younger or equal at 34 years old, the result was 43.2 delivery rate. This is not a clinical pregnancy. This is a delivery rate. They're all born. So what you expect with vitrified old sites from a very young woman is to have as high as 43, which is exactly the same as what we obtain in the general population with fresh old sites. And strangely, one year later, a few months later, we had the results from the randomized controlled trial performed by Anna Cobo and colleagues. This is a beautiful study, randomized controlled trial on fresh versus vitrified all site in an egg donation problem, very few confounding factors. And what they found, surprisingly, is that vitrified all site and fresh oil site with young oil site, with good quality oil site, was around 43%, exactly what we saw in our patient population of infantile women, but with very young, less than 35 years old. So it came to my mind that age and oil site quality is the real confounding factor, not vitrification itself. When you think about results, first of all, we have to think about what we are using. So we tried to go on with our study, and we made a multicentric longitudinal cohort study. We want to see the reproducibility of the technology in different centers for different indications, all in the infertile population. And this is to put the number together, to have more numbers and more convincing results. More than 2,000 all sites, the survival rate when you have a, a, a normal routine application of all site vitrification of any kind of all site at metaphase 2 stage, it is expected to be around 85%. Although in the study it was higher when you introduce it in the lab and everybody is doing it as a routine, this is the reality. And it was consistent in the three centers which were expert in all site prior preservation. So I would state that we should expect 85% survival rate. And what we obtained at the end of the story, uh, 128 deliveries, 147 newborn, but also some embryos that were re-vitrified a second time. 
So I could express the results saying that we obtained 5.4% per, of the oocyte became a baby in this study. But what happened is that the best patient has still some cryopreserved embryo from this court because they got pregnant on the first cycle, while the worst patient has used all their oocyte to obtain, not to obtain the pregnancy or to obtain the pregnancy. So it's very difficult to make a percentage of oocytes because they are linked to each other, the court of oocyte. Each oocyte from the same court are linked to each other. So what I like to do is to consider the court as one and not each oocyte as one, because like this, I have um, included the confounding factors coming from the patient. So we did a different kind of analysis. We did what is called a partitioning analysis. So the outcome was the delivery rate. So here you have that the, in general population, we obtained 128 delivery, which means 28.4% of delivery in the general population of infertile women from uh, 30 to 42 years old uh, using vitrified oocyte. So this is the general population. And then the computer says, okay, it is significant according to the number of oocytes. The most predictive value was the number of oocytes that was obtained by the patient. It's not for sure that we have used all these oocytes, but what is for sure is that if you have a good ovarian reserve, more than eight oocytes, you have a double chance to obtain a pregnancy as compared to a woman, which ha to a woman that has a low ovarian reserve. Again, it's not that we have used all the oocytes. We have just categorized the patient good responder versus bad responders. And I'm not so sure that if you take two times four oocytes on this population of patients, it's the same as having eight oocytes altogether when thinking about the quality of the oocyte. This is a, a no question. It's not the absolute number, but it is the number reflects, in my opinion, the quality of the oocyte that you obtain. But of course, we will know perhaps much later using higher numbers. Then the age, the age has a very important wave. And in our study population, it was, the cutoff was 38 years old. So if you have a, good, a, a bad response to a viral reserve and you have higher than 38, 38 years old, you have only 12.6% delivery rate. But on the opposite, if you have a very good ovarian reserve and you have a chance to have good quality embryo, this is something that you cannot predict before, so you go to blastocyst stage because you have enough good quality embryo on day three, then the results by having more than eight oocytes and good quality embryos, blastocyst stage transfer is 62.1 delivery rate. It's not 100%, but it is something I think really very, very interesting. But look, if you don't have good quality embryos, you cannot go to blastocyst. Even if you have a very good ovarian reserve, the results will be completely different. And this cannot be predicted in our, when I think about social freezing or age-related freezing, you will never know how will be the quality of the embryo of, of that particular patient. So you don't know if, say, uh, you need eight oocytes, 20 oocytes, or 40 oocytes, probably something that we will never know. As we don't know for fresh cycle, it is exactly the same problem. So last study that we, we have submitted just a few days ago, it's about um, what happened when the law changed. You know, but since 2009, we could inseminate only three eggs, and then we were vitrifying the, the rest of the eggs and looking to the cumulative results. Now we can inseminate all the oocytes. We don't have restriction anymore on the creation of embryo. So we inseminate all the oocytes like everybody does. We, we select the best embryo, we freeze the embryo, and we come back. And these are the results. So it is a, a fantastic model to see how all site cryopreservation works for a particular patient. So which is the expect, what the patient, how can we can predict the pregnancy when using all the all site that has been vitrified at all site stage or at embryonic, embryonic stage. And surprisingly, we didn't find any difference in the fresh cycle, a slight improvement, but not significant. And the vitrified cycles works as well when you use all side vitrified or embryo. 
So it seems that really the in vitro performance is the same, but what's the significant difference between the two groups, which is very important, is the number of cycles that the patient has to do to get the same results. If you go to embryo or to blastocyst, you will have, you will have less embryo, which means less cycle for the patient. When you do all site prior preservation, and I think about also social freezing, if you if you freeze or you, you vitrify 20 or side, how many cycles this patient will have to do before saying you can, there is nothing to do anymore or to get the pregnancy? So the difference is the absolute number of cycles that the patient had to do to obtain exactly the same cumulative resu results. So 258 when we use embryo cryopreserved, 297 when we use all site cryopreservation. There are 40 additional transfer that the patient had to do to obtain the same result. And I think it's very important, also related to the time to get the pregnancy. So according to this, I would say that if a patient has frozen or vitrified the all site, 20 all site, I would warm all of them together when she will be ready with a partner, create the embryos, and then in eventually refreeze, we vitrify the embryos, because I don't want this patient to go through five or 10 attempts. I think it's not fair, but this is something also open for the discussion. So now, potential risk. IVF has potential risk, that's for sure, but it's not only related to all site prior preservation. Any kind of assisted te reproductive technology has some potential risk that are related to metabolomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, epigenetic, who knows? We know that this is there. This is there also because we are treating an infertile population which is at high risk to have these kind of problems. The population itself is at risk. But one thing we know is that the chromosomal abnormality is related to the age. And it's a dramatic correlation. And we know that, according to our results of PGS, at 40 years old, you have 75, about 75% 75 of the embryo that has chromosomal abnormality. So if I think about using 32 years old all site cryopreserved or fresh old site of a 41 years old, I would say that it's much more safer, for sure, to use young all site. Because although we have not enough data about all site cryopreservation, we have a lot of data about chromosomal abnormality, age-related. So it is, for me, a safer procedure, safer than the art in general. And it is also published in different studies and also to our experience in the baby born. So to conclude, I am a woman. I'm over 40, unfortunately. And I, I have to say, although I have two children, but there is a biological inequity between males and female, and we are only talking about female preservation of fertility, but what about the man? I'm sorry, he can freeze his sperm whenever he wants and have baby over 80 years old. I think we should restore an equity between male and female based, of course, on evidence-based medicine and on good counseling to the patient, seeing the truth that there is no guarantee of success in medicine in any treatment and also with all site prior preservation, even if you have a very good response and you freeze a lot of eggs. This is true also for fresh cycle. But what we also know, that all site prior preservation is not an experimental technique. It is a very efficient technique at any stage of development. There is a lot of results. There are randomized control trials, meta-analysis of randomized control trials. I'm sorry, vitrification, it is an effective technology which is not experimental and can be used as we use embryo vitrification, blastocyst vitrification, and sperm prior preservation. So coming back to the original question, can all site preservation really give an acceptable chance of pregnancy? I would say yes, as it is for assist reproductive technology in general. Acceptable, age-related, factors related, patient related, sperm related, and all the confounding factors that you can find in fresh, in fresh cycle. So normally the last question is, uh, but uh, if I can choose, should I freeze all site, PN stage, embryo, or blastocyst? First of all, you should vitrify, but that's another question. And secondly, I think that you can do it whenever you want. It's a philosophical problem. If it is for fertility preservation, why should you put a sperm from a donor when you can really efficiently cryopreserve all site. 
It is f if it is for a copper, why don't you select the embryo as much as you can to have less embryos and less transfer to do to the patient, probably to obtain the same results? The total efficiency should be the same because although you expect less implantation rate at all size stage because it's a less selected cell, but you also have an absolute number, which is much higher, of course. You have 10 oci and three blastocysts. Three blastocysts with higher implantation potential, but 10 oci. So it is really in our hand, in our philosophy, according to the patient and will, that we should choose the day of vitrification. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice presentation, Laura. Thank you. I would like to open this presentation for discussion. Yes, behind there is, please, microphone. Before he will start, I would like to ask, is there any place now for the ovarian cortex to freeze instead of the oocytes? Of course, all side cryopreservation cannot be used in prepubertal patients, so but we, may, we have to find an alternative, and I know that there is very few centers that have already good results, especially, I think, about uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, I have no experience with uh, cortex uh, cryopreservation, so I cannot answer more than what I've read from the literature, but I think that there will be very soon an available kit able to, to preserve also cortex. But the number of the cycles that they have done the uh, cortex uh, ovarian preservation and uh, transplantation is still unknown. You know? It is still unknown in the general literature, but it is known from reference centers. I think about Anderson in particular. He has very nice results, consistent, but of course we are talking about very low numbers. But I'm not involved in this kind, but I'm sure that in the future it will be possible. There is good hope, I think, in the literature also for prepubertal patients and young girls that has to face oncological treatment, and I'm, I'm, we have to work also on this. Okay. The question? Michel. Yeah, Michel Camus, Brussels. Uh, thank you for your very uh, clear presentation. What I would like to ask is, would you, uh, do you have data on implantation potential of uh, vitrified blastocysts originating for, from vitrified uh, oocytes, so two times vitrification. Uh, I have a very few personal data, but Peter Neji in Atlanta, who is young, using, uh, and also Anna Cobo, who is using cryopreserved oocyte for donating cycles. He made even three rounds of vitrification with similar results, so I think that uh, blastocysts are really very resistant to vitrification, especially blastocysts. And, and I say this because of our PGD program, where sometimes we have to vitrify two times for blastocysts, and it's really working very, very well. Uh, big data I cannot give, but single experience from Anacobo and Peter Neji, they really s show the same implantation potential when you re vitrify blastocysts, even originating from cryopreserved oocyte or cryopreserved oocyte and vitrified embryos. So it's really encouraging. There was a poster of Peter of two round vitrification with the same implantation rate. Can I complete also, we do merely the um, zygote uh, vitrification and uh, we do also the revitrification of the blastocyst and we replace them later and we have also good results uh, with the implantation rate and pregnancy rate. and. From Brazil, we have done two cycles also, and these are case reports published. So revitrification is possible, and it works, not like the slow freezing. And, and what is very interesting with vitrification, that it can be done on PGDs, on, on, on embryo that has been manipulated for biopsy without any problem. And this, is, this was true for all sites with the opening in the zona, but also for embryos and blastocysts. So this is a big difference with slow freezing, where we had a lot of problems for biopsied embryos. So I think it's really a, a, a great opportunity for the lab and a, a, a great possibility to really cryopreserve whatever you have in any moment according to the patient uh, problem and the patient will. As Dominic. I also have a question. Um, you just said um, that 
you probably would prefer to thaw all the eggs at once, um, create possibly multiple embryos, and then refreeze them if you have too many, uh, instead of having several thawing cycles. Um, you just said that there is not that much uh, evidence or experience with revitrification of embryos. So I wonder why would you then suggest it? Uh, okay, I suggested it's only thinking about the number of cycles, but the, when it will be, when the patient will come back, I'm thinking about social freezing. Yes. So today we are freezing, as you said, 10, 20 or sites per patient, and they will come back in two, three, four years' time. I don't know, but probably it will take time before they come back, and I think that we will have uh, evidence at that time. Anyway, to go through five, six transfer, I mean, it is really a long, a long story. Yeah, but uh, I think that the number so of the transfers time to will be the same, isn't it? Because you, no. you create, for instance, five embryos. If you freeze all four them all together, you put two back, and then you have three embryos, which you still have to transfer over multiple cycles. No, but if you, f uh, if you warm the old side, three by three, like we used to do because of the law, you will have, I don't know, oh, yes, in Italy, six, yes. yeah. Yes. Six. No, three if you, three if you the, just the, yeah. warm the number of all side, yeah. but you want to have only one or two embryos, it yeah. will be a very low number. So you will go through a lot of warmings. Yeah. But if you warm all together, I'm just talking, yeah. I mean, uh, in a, like this empirical way, and, and you keep them to blastocysts, you probably will have at the end of the story three or four or five blastocysts, yeah. which means that you transfer one by one, yeah. highly selected, and that probably that patient will have not more than three or four transfer, which is already a lot. Yeah. And cumulatively, according to our results with very low number of all side use per time, cumulatively, you will not lose anything. But, but the time to pregnancy yeah. will be lower. Yeah, yes. and then one okay, more. if second round vitrification yeah. will not affect embryos, but has to be yeah. proven yet. And one more question. Um, patients often ask whether or, or not the oocytes they have frozen of good quality. Of course, at the moment, we can only tell whether they're mature or not, and there are some, some other tests. Do you think in the future we'll be able to better predict, uh, apart from the age of freezing, uh, what the quality eventually is, to give a better idea of, of how many eggs she will need to freeze? That's the dream of any embryologist, hmm? to be able to <laughs> yeah. predict uh, the quality of our cells. I think it is difficult because it's a multi-factor factor. It's not only metabolism, it's not only chromosomes, although we know that chromosomes has a wave which is very important. But uh, step by step, we will have additional information uh, to select our, uh, our embryos and I think also the old side by using new technology and I think especially biological, molecular biology, but it's difficult to predict. Okay. We didn't do so much in the last 20 years, so I expect that the next 20 years will be better. Mm. Okay. And also the <laughs> type of stimulation protocols, this is very effective. Yeah. More questions? If not, uh, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. And